So hi, um, I'm an MIS trained surgeon. I still take acute care surgery calls. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about when we get called in as general surgeons um, by our OB urology colleagues when they have some misadventures um, in the OR um, and kind of thoughts about trying to stay MIS, um, kind of whatever their approach they're taking. Um, so I have no disclosures. So just to start off with some interesting facts. Um, uh, so laparoscopic surgery in general has uh, fairly few complications when it comes to laparoscopic technique in uh, particular. Um, but of those laparoscopic specific complications, um, almost 50% of those occur when we're gaining intra-abdominal access. Um, the small bowel is the most common GI organ that's injured. Um, again, that's typically during gaining um, access into the abdomen. And the inferior epigastric vessels are the most commonly um, injured vascular structure. So typically, those are related to poor placements. Um, so getting intra-abdominal access. Um, so I definitely have been called into the OR by uh, our other spe uh, surgical colleagues. I'm having difficulty getting pneumoperitoneum. Um, typically, these are patients who may have um, unusual body habitus, morbid obese patients, um, or if they've had multiple prior abdominal surgeries and have significant um, intra-abdominal adhesions, making it difficult to get access. So just a quick review, these are some of the most common types of um, techniques on getting intra-abdominal access, the closed varus needle technique, um, open Hassan or modified Hassan technique, and the optical direct visualization technique. Um, most of the studies out there demonstrate that none of these have, um, or they're all equally effective, not one is necessarily safer than the other. So it really comes down to surgeon comfort, surgeon preference. And I would argue that the same is when you get called in to help out um, OB or urology to get access, you should do what you're comfortable with. Now, I think a caveat to that is sometimes depending on what they've attempted, it can certainly um, alter the anatomy. I've run into situations uh, where there's a lot of su uh, subcutaneous emphysema from prior attempts to gaining access, so you may need to adjust um, what you do. But again, do what you're comfortable with, get the instruments that you, know, you use uh, normally. Um, you may need to try some different techniques, but I think all of us have been well-trained um, and can utilize any of these techniques to help them get into the abdomen. Um, before we jump into some other scenarios, I think some pearls to kind of keep in mind when you do get called into um, other ORs. So remember, we are GI surgeons. Uh, we do a lot of laparoscopic surgery, and so I think um, we are experts at laparoscopic surgery. Utilize your resources. Uh, don't feel limited by what instruments they're using. Um, feel free to ask for other scopes, other instruments that you're comfortable with. Um, five millimeter ports are gimmies. Add additional ports if you need to. Um, and then again, we can always fall back um, and convert to open if needed. But um, if the patient is stable and you can do what you need to do safely, um, minimally invasively, I think these are things to uh, consider. So enterotomies, bowel injuries, um, these can occur even with our own cases. Um, typically, we can see this with gaining access um, with the varus needle injuries, trocar injuries, lysis of adhesions, um, or even just with grasper manipulation. Um, to borrow from the double AST, uh, when we look at um, GI organ injuries, um, this is the injury scale. Um, we kind of think about uh, when to do a primary repair versus resection. Um, I think the literature shows that for grade one and grade two injuries, um, those do well with primary repair, um, grade three probably as well. But once we get into grade four, grade five injuries, um, those likely will need a resection. Um, I think when we look at when to divert, um, when you have a bowel injury, I think small bowel typically does pretty well with a primary repair resection. Colon's a little bit different, I think depending on the amount of contamination that you see, um, the patient's hemodynamic um, status, you might want to divert. Um, the trauma literature definitely shows that resection with primary anastomosis, people have very good outcomes and they do quite well. Um, but we see a lot of pelvic um, surgery with the urologist and OBGYNs, and so we are getting a lot into kind of rectal distal colon territory. Um, and so in those cases, doing a loop ileostomy um, or an end colostomy to divert um, uh, might be a, a possibility. 
I think the other thing to keep in mind is to utilize endoscopy. So um, again, if you're dealing with um, some kind of pelvic surgery, there's concern for a rectal um, or distal colon injury, being able to do a proctoscopy, a flexible sigmoidoscopy, calling for the colonos uh, colonoscopy, excuse me, the colonoscopy um, to evaluate for injury, that's also quite helpful. Um, and uh, you may not have to do any um, extensive surgery, actually. So vascular injury, um, kind of one of the dreaded things we worry about. Um, so I think the number one thing is control of hemorrhage, which can be difficult and daunting when we're dealing with an, uh, um, an MIS reproach. Um, you know, it's always um, a consideration to just get control of the hemorrhage, pack, pressure. So getting a gauze in there, um, putting direct pressure on um, whatever's bleeding, if you can get a grasper on it, um, at least just to get control, give anesthesia time to catch up. I think that's another big important factor is to communicate with the anesthesia, let them know that you're running into bleeding um, problems, if we need to get blood products, if you need to initiate massive transfusion protocol. Um, I think the other thing is, especially when you're dealing with um, an MIS surgery, getting adequate visualization. Um, and so if you need to put in additional ports um, to help with retraction. Um, I had a case once where we were dealing with pelvic bleeding um, after a hysterectomy and the bladder was extremely full. It was really limiting our uh, visualization so we just decompressed the bladder with a Foley um, and we were able to kind of see what was bleeding and so just considerations like that. Um, obviously the patient is hemodynamically stable. You can't do what you safely need to do laparoscopically or um, robotically. You need to convert to open. Um, I put solid organ injury under this. Um, so again, we see liver injuries with the varus needle or the trocar when you get in, and typically those do pretty well with uh, pressure, um, packing um, for a little bit. You can use hemostatic, hemostatic agents as well. Um, so hernias, uh, typically I would say I think inguinal hernias and ventral hernias are kind of caught in the preoperative management um, when you're working with the urologist or the gynecologist. And so a lot of times these are known ahead of time um, and can be planned. Um, there is a lot of literature out there demonstrating that um, concurrent inguinal hernia repair and ventral hernia repair, even with mesh in the setting of urologic and gynecologic procedures is very safe and effective. Um, and people have good outcomes in terms of both of the primary surgeries. So um, certainly if you run into this in a more emergent fashion, I think it's reasonable to do. Um, if, you, if you need to, if it'll benefit the patient, um, but the literature out there does support um, doing the, these surgeries concurrently with other urologic and gynecologic procedures. I think the one thing to consider um, is, you know, if you do have to place mesh, considering the contamination from the other uh, procedure that's ongoing. Um, the other thing that we run into occasionally is management of infected wounds, so um, extraction site wounds after nephrectomies or prostatectomies, C-sections, um, things of those natures we'll get asked to help out with. And so just kind of remembering the principles of wound care, debridement, um, wound back management, which our uh, OBGYN urology colleagues may not be comfortable with. Uh, and finally, incidental findings. Um, so these are obviously things that we come across as well during our surgeries, um, but uh, for the urologists and the OBGYNs, um, when they're doing their surgeries, oftentimes you know, they'll ask us to come in and see, um, look for things that look a little unusual to them. Um, there's not a lot of literature on how to manage these. Um, there's a lot some ethical um, concerns and uh, issues in that sense on how to uh, manage and um, deal with these things as they come up. Um, I would say if it's something that would change the management for the primary surgeon, if they're doing an oncologic procedure and they see a lesion on the liver um, with concern for METS and that would change what they would do, I think doing a biopsy, a wedge biopsy, or a, needle, a core needle biopsy like this picture shows um, has pretty little risk to the patient um, and can be easily done um, with an MIS approach. And so I think that has good benefit for the patient um, you know, oftentimes, um, as Dr. Gudziak um, alluded to in her surgery, or in her presentation, excuse me, um, patients with pelvic problems, sometimes it's hard to tease out what is what, and so the OBGYNs will take them back, and ultimately it turns out to be the appendix. And so, um, you know, doing an appendectomy, certainly in that situation, um, is beneficial to the patient. 
Um, so just to reemphasize again, I think when you get called into these cases, remember you're a laparoscopic surgeon as well. Utilize your resources, ask for instruments that you're comfortable with. If you need to put in ports to uh, manage the pathology that you're asked to help out with, do that. Um, again, five millimeter ports are gimmies. Um, and at the end of the day, if you need to, you certainly can convert to open.